So I want to talk about quantum uh, partly because it's just a little kind of, uh, I wouldn't say hobby, that's completely the wrong word to use, but like a pet kind of fascination of mine. It seems that everything these days is to do with quantum, if not machine learning. Um, this kind of goes back to a story uh, a bit earlier on in the year that Aaron covered about the vulnerability that was discovered in a post-quantum a crypto algorithm called Psyche. So I'll get back to that in a minute. But as I said, everything seems to be quantum at the moment. Uh, CERN, I believe, created the first black hole on Earth just a few weeks or months ago, which is all quite uh, insane. We had our first fusion reaction to output more energy that we put in. We've got research that suggests that quantum mechanics are used in our brain. We've got quantum research, uh, you know, being inter inter interjected with machine learning. So the kind of possibilities of quantum mechanics and physics is just insane. But, you know, to most of us, from a security point of view, we're going to be fascinated about quantum computing because it's quantum computing that poses a potential threat to the traditional security that we use uh, on the web and pretty much in all our digital lives at the moment. So quantum computing is a complete quick 101 refresher, you know, differs very much from classical computers, uh, computers which uses logic gates, you know, AND gates and OR gates to operate on bits, basically ones and zeros. Uh, quantum computing is very, very different uh, and takes advantage of a few different quantum mechanics from superposition to entanglement and interference. Uh, and some of those are going to be in, you know, important to understand why quantum computing and why the threat it poses to traditional cryptography is such a problem. So as I said, we've been talking about the threat that quantum computing poses to cryptography for a while. Um, and first of all, I always like to kind of clear this up. People talk about quantum cryptography, totally not a thing, doesn't exist. There is no quantum crypto. What, what does exist is the use of quantum mechanics to exchange symmetric keys. And the reason that's useful is that we can exchange symmetric keys really, really securely. And then because of the properties of quantum mechanics, we know if someone's uh, been essentially kind of eavesdropping. Uh, because as soon as you measure uh, an entangled element, you, you can detect that on the other side, basically. So that's a great way that quantum mechanics can be used for traditional crypto, but there is no quantum cryptography itself. So when we talk about quantum crypto, what we really mean is either the use of quantum for key exchange or the use of quantum computing to then go and break traditional crypto. So the idea is that a sufficiently large quantum computer can break asymmetric crypto. And that's another point to remember as well. Our symmetric crypto, so once we've done that initial key exchange, symmetric crypto is believed to be reasonably secure, even from quantum computers. They're not significantly quicker, uh, if at all, than traditional computers from essentially just trying to perform an exhaustive key search, like a brute force attack on a symmetric key. So the real problem it poses are to the things like RSA and Diffie-Hellman key exchanges. They're the, they're the real problems. Quantum computers will make traditional crypto vulnerable. Um, but to me, I think the really interesting point isn't just the lack of confidentiality. It's not the encryption itself. It's the bigger implication about trust uh, and identity, which, which quantum to me is going to you know, be a much, much bigger problem. Because ultimately, if you think about the ability for quantum computers to break or, or forge signatures, everything's out the window. There is no trust. There's no identity. You cannot possibly guarantee you're going to a legitimate site because the certificate could have been forged. Code signing can be completely forged. And there'll be no, all that element of trust um, and, and, and uh, veracity is, is out the window. So where are we with quantum computers? Uh, well, we've heard about qubits. I'm sure most of us have heard about qubits anyway. Uh, following IBM's really quite impressive track record back in 2016, they had a whopping five qubits in their quantum computers, which is all fairly tiny. Uh, but you fast forward through the years, in 2019, they went up to 27 qubits. 2020 saw 65 qubits. 2021, 127. And then last year was 443. Uh, now, next year, they're projecting to release uh, the first cube, well, the first quantum computer with over a thousand qubits at 1221. Now, there are other systems with much greater qubit counts, about 5,000, uh, a machine called D Wave, I believe, or from D Wave, D -Wave I should say. But they're very specialized quantum computers. What IBM's creating is a generic uh, and kind of versatile quantum computer that can be used to process a number of algorithms. And that's the key thing, because to break RSA, Andy for Hellman, you know, makes, you know, we require the use of running the what's called what's known as the Shores algorithm. And it's that which effectively breaks RSA and Diffie Hellman computers. 
IBM are also projecting uh, a 4,000 qubit computer by 2025. And it's that kind of level that starts to get a little bit worrying uh, because to factor a 2048-bit RSA key requires around about 4,000 qubits. Uh, generally speaking, you kind of double the RSA key length to, to kind of find out how many qubits in theory you need to break that. Now, the performance of quantum computers uh, isn't just about the number of qubits. Uh, it absolutely does relate to qubits. So it revolves around sort of scale and you know how many qubits you can have in any one quantum computer. It also relies on the, the quality, you know, integrity, because there are many um, faster or, or you know, corner computers with a much higher qubit rates, but have much more noise and, that, and therefore much lower kind of quality of, of, um, of processing. And then you need the traditional speed. You know, there are, it's not just about qubits. We're talking about kind of specialized gates in corner computers, and it's the speed of those gates, which is also really important. So the kind of current estimation, I believe, is that, you know, when we get to around about um, 1.17 mega qubits, it will take around about 100 days to crack 2K key. So these things aren't around the corner, but the progress that IBM uh, have made has been exponential. I actually plotted the, the, the few values they had, and it shows an almost perfectly exponential kind of rate. So these things are growing at you know an insane kind of rate. So if anything, you know, if we learn, we need to learn anything from previous examples is that technology, you know, doesn't slow down. It doesn't follow a linear path. It does progress generally quicker than, than we think. So what are we doing about this as an industry? Well, NIST years ago kicked off a post-quantum program to look at algorithms that would be safe against quantum computers. Uh, they started off with about 69 proposal or candidates in 2017. They whittled it down to 26, and we're now down to four. And it was one of those which made the story, uh, made the news kind of headlines a few months ago uh, that Aaron mentioned, called Psych, which stands for Super Singular Isogeny Key Encapsulation. And I will say nothing for cryptographers if that they're not brilliant at coming up with really cool, uh, futuristic sounding names for things. So <clears throat> that's, I mean, sounds awesome if nothing else. But turns out it's trivially uh, crackable. I believe a single CPU core could crack the algorithm in hours. Um, when researchers looked at it, it was a purely kind of mathematical based attack. But what's interesting is that technically the attack is on the algorithm, uh, not the kind of method of key exchange. So the, the attacks on super singular isogeny to key Hellman, uh, which all intents and purposes means that Psyche is vulnerable because Psyche uses the SIDH algorithm. So it, it's still essentially the same sort of, you know, same difference basically. I think what's really worrying and really um, interesting about this is that it took this algorithm getting down to the final four for researchers to really poke at it and find this kind of vulnerability. Uh, Jonathan Katz, an IEEE member and professor of the Department of Computer Science at the University of Maryland, uh, was speaking to Ars Technica, and he was quoted as saying, three of the four post-quantum crypto schemes rely on relatively new assumptions whose exact difficulty is not well understood. And that's the key, I think. You know, we take the security of RSA to Helman, we believe them to be secure. We believe there is no efficient polynomial time way of, of kind of cracking those. And similarly, we're now coming up with algorithms that we need to try and trust and believe are secure, but could take some time to, to find, you know, academically or, 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 you know, mathematically provably secure algorithms. So we're down to the final four, arguably down now to the final three algorithms. Um, and it remains to be seen whether the final three left uh, will, will stand the test of time and remain to be kind of secure. I'm sure most people kind of appreciate that, you know, as a as a tease at the start of this, if we get to a stage in it could be a few years, maybe up to ten years before we have a, a sufficiently large quantum crypto, uh, sorry, quantum computer to break traditional crypto, the implications are massive. You know, everything from uh, web security, as I said, to code signing. Uh, but I think for me, it's the kind of physical devices which pose the biggest risk. Um, it's medical devices, operation technology, IoT devices that have been put out on the internet. Uh, or, or placed into our kind of hospitals that struggle to kind of get patched and updated to, to, to mitigate fairly trivial vulnerabilities and problems, you know, having to then implement brand new crypto libraries and algorithms um, in some cases will bring the machines to, uh, you know, very slow performance, might even need possibly new hardware to make them work properly. And those devices that we've seen are very difficult to update in a timely and cost efficient manner. So we've got two kind of problems that quantum computing poses at the moment. One is that quantum computing can and will break RSA and traditional Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchanges. The other risk is that we're kind of arguably 
I wouldn't say rushing, but if we go too quickly, we run the risk of you know standardizing on a new algorithm that turns out to be insecure in a few years' time, and we're in a pretty bad state. Now, the current uh, kind of advice uh, to kind of cope with the quantum computing world and the risk it poses to crypto is to generally double key sizes for RSA and Diffie-Hellman um, kind of key lengths. What's interesting is that that will absolutely buy us time, but Whilst the world has been generally moving to elliptic curve diffie Hellman because of, it offers a very similar level of security to RSA, the actual key sizes are much smaller. Now, when you consider how quantum computing works, that's really fascinating because actually the fact that diffie Hellman uses significant, or elliptic curve diffie Hellman uses significantly smaller key sizes means that it is potentially far more vulnerable to quantum crypto than RSA. So we could see a temporary shift back with the industry moving to much larger RSA keys, uh, for example, six or eight K keys as a kind of short-term stopgap uh, until we find a truly uh, tried and trusted reliable method for implementing a, a post-quantum um, you know, mechanism or algorithm. Uh, what's interesting is um, President Joe Biden's recently signed the Quantum Computing Cybersecurity Preparedness Act, which is a bit of a mouthful, uh, just before Christmas on December 21st. Um, it doesn't have an awful lot of teeth in it, uh, but it's, it is essentially asking government organizations to at least take a good inventory of all systems that rely on traditional crypto so that when time the time comes to switch, organizations are at least aware. Uh, going back to, to Aaron's topic around the kind of exchange vulnerabilities, half of these issues are to do with just visibility and, and organizations just not knowing these systems are out there. They've maybe forgotten they've deployed a system. So having a good inventory is going to be important. Uh, but one of the other requirements that the Act has is that organizations implement the post-quantum crypto algorithms within a year after they've been finalized. So it should hopefully force organizations to, to perform the patches and get them updated, just as long as they know where those systems are. You uh, you talked about how fast, yeah, relatively fast. You know, IBM is uh, increasing the number of qubits in their quantum platforms, um, and the way it's doubling every year or so just brought me back to Moore's law, mm -hmm. right? And, and you know that that was true for transistor counts in classical computing for a very long time until we sort of started to deviate from it. It's interesting to go back to a place where that kind of, of doubling of, of computational density, I guess, is true again. And that race that you mentioned between uh, how secure our crypto is and, and how many qubits there are available to break it is going to be a really interesting one. I think given how slowly how slow we tend to be to adopt new standards as an industry, as a world, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure I, I fancy our chances in that race. Um, <laughs> I mean, you you made me think about, let's say, SHA-1, right, which has been deprecated for a long time. And yet, uh, this was this recently, anyway, 2005, it hasn't been considered secure, since 2005, NIST formally deprecated it in 2011, disallowed its use for digital signatures in 2013, but we declared that it should be phased out by 2030, which, you know, last time I checked, is still some distance in the future. That's It's such a long timeline to make those changes, and that's before you get to, like you said, Internet of Things devices that that can't be patched either because they've been abandoned or because implementing anything stronger is going to make them grind to a complete halt. It's it's, it's going to be an interesting landscape change. And I think it's going to be hard to keep up with both technically and practically. <laughs> yeah, I think um, something you, you mentioned, I think, was the kind of availability of these systems. Uh, you know, we're, we're not all, we'll be, you know, we won't all be ending up with quantum computers uh, in our server rooms, let alone our bedrooms or offices, you know, home offices. But uh, what's interesting is that everything's available as a service these days, from phishing kits to quantum computers, as it turns out. You know, IBM and Google, I believe, have their own quantum computers as a service. So, you know, we don't need for these to become 
financially or widely available to ourselves, we can just go and use these systems in the cloud, which is fantastic for researchers, you know, people who want to do uh, modeling of nature or weather systems or crack RSA algorithms. And it obviously means that whilst you can just go and rent a corner computer for a number of hours or days to perform other benign or you know um, malicious kind of activities, we still have millions of end user systems to actually go and patch. And uh, so it does feel like a very kind of asymmetric uh, problem that we've got. So for any of our listeners or viewers out there who are, are unfamiliar with quantum computing, um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly no expert, but I would highly recommend that you just take a look at what, um, uh, what quantum entanglement means and try to imagine, I guess, the implications to things like algorithms. So that would be kind of my thing. Otherwise, uh, if you don't want to do that, you can continue to feel like you are lost in uh, F5's new mega encabulator, which is forthcoming. 